conceptual option is honored to speak to two of England's most prominent and outspoken proponents of surrogacy in the gay community. I'd like to introduce you to Michael and Wes. Michael is the co-founder of twodads.uk, which is an organization which helps intended fathers in the UK achieve their dreams of fatherhood via surrogacy. Michael is a surrogacy advocate and is tirelessly working for change with regards to surrogacy in, U in the UK. He also helps run a same-sex parents page on Facebook and speaks at national fertility events and contributes to the charity Surrogacy UK. He has a parenting column in Fertility Road magazine and also has contributed to the website Gays with Kids. Wes is the father of their eldest child from a previous straight marriage and actively supports the LGBTQ community with Michael. Wes works full time for a football club in the UK. Michael and Wes were invited to speak to a parliamentary group on their experience of being two dads going through the surrogacy process. Both have made, both have made it their mission to normalize the journey of same-sex parenting. Welcome, Michael and Wes. Thank you so much for being here. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. The, the, the very first thing that we need to do is we need to congratulate you on the fifth member of your family, Duke. Yes. yes, he's a week old today. Oh my God, congratulations. Uh, I wanna also just let everybody know that uh, Tallulah and Duke are in the same room doing their best to be quiet, but they're young, and so we're gonna do the best we can to make it a family affair without it being too crazy, right? <laughs> we're yeah. gonna try our best. So let's start with uh, the basics. Tell me a little bit about how you two met and how long you've been together. Can you take that one? No, I'll do it. <laughs> so uh, Michael and I met at uh, Pride in our local town. Well, I say town, it's a city. It's Birmingham uh, in the UK. And uh, it was in 2012. So we've been together now for seven years and we've been married for five. Yeah, we have. What is it like uh in the uk uh, in terms of marriage and acceptance of gay marriage there um i think we're really lucky if i'm honest um we got married in 2014 which was the first year that gay marriage was legalized in the uk and we uh, we had an incredible ceremony with all our friends and family there it was amazing and i think generally in the uk we're we're really fortunate that the majority of society is really accepting when it comes to gay marriage and we're we're fortunate to live in a in a country that that welcomes and and and, and welcomes us with open arms when it comes to that but also the law protects us as well so mm -hmm. we we live in a country where the law protects our right to be married yeah which is has just happened in the united states and it just must be a huge weight off of your shoulders. I mean, talk about some of the things that that means for you as parents and as a married couple, what it means to be protected. Because I think a lot of people don't understand kind of the, the human things about what it means to be protected under the law. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even if you just go back to 2010, I think it was when surrogacy was permitted for gay couples you know prior to that the law didn't allow gay men to ap apply for a parental order which is ultimately the piece of paper which gives you the legal status of the child of your child um which isn't that long ago um now obviously we've we've got the equal marriage act here now and you know that just i think that's the icing on the cake for a lot of um gay and lesbians in the uk because it just gives us that that level of equality that um you know since section 28 here in the uk and, and and everything else it just um it just makes it a safer place generally for us to be who we who we are and and i think the other thing just to add to that is talk about what that means for the kids um well it means that we're protected so should there in the horrific event that there should be any hate 
um, given to us or we, we come under any type of a, a, attack there. You know, we're, we're protected by law, first and foremost, that you know, any type of uh, any type of abuse is, is, is unacceptable and protected by law. Um, I think it's pretty reassuring though as parents that uh, if, if that was to ever happen, we would gather the support of the law behind us. And I think there are some countries in the world where you, you, you couldn't say that and you couldn't have that reassurance. And I think it would be challenging to bring children up in countries such as, as those. So I think we're very fortunate that we are protected by law and it also gives us that comfort and it allows us just to actually get on with our lives and be parents and not have to worry about those elements that some other countries have to worry about. Yeah, you almost lose the the label or the or the, the sexuality becomes irrelevant, you know, because we we just want to be parents. We just want to parent our children. We don't we don't want to be branded as same sex parents. Although we are, we it'd be nice that when the time comes that that label can just fall away and we're just parents. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you do, you know, you do have it bounced around as same sex parents, which is what we are, but you don't bounce it around saying it's uh, straight parents or yeah. heterosexual yeah. parents. Yeah. It, it's never a label for them. So why should it be a label for us? Mm -hmm. So hopefully that, that will change and we'll just be known as, you know, parents to yeah. our three children. Be known as a couple of good parents who love their kids and are raising kids that are, are happy and healthy. And I, I guess that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk just a little bit about the law is really, in, in a sense, going through this in America just recently, it's, it's the next step toward normalization, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Absolutely yeah. that. Uh, and, yeah. it's, and it's part of the work that we do. Um, it's like destigmatizing, really. And, and it's mainly destigmatizing to an audience that doesn't understand or doesn't want to understand or is afraid of. So we're kind of putting our life out there for everyone to view and to pick and to comment on, but it's to help and support other couples like us in similar situations, or even those that are too afraid to stick their head above the parapet. We want to show the world and, and the community that we're great parents, it's, it's achievable, when you want something and dream for something that bad, we can, you know, anything's within reach. And that's kind of what we want to demonstrate. And I want our kids to look back when they're a bit older and say that, you know, we did the right thing. Yeah. And that they were proud of us for doing this and leading this you know, motion and being involved in the law commissioners and helping create and cha make change. That's what we, we want our kids to remember us for. Yeah. And, and I mean, I just think that it's such a, a huge thing for you being willing to do that from both the perspective of, of the gay community and the people that are learning and want to come to this level of acceptance, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then also, it's clear to me that you guys are really uh, connected to helping people in the straight community to find why this is important and why it's okay and, and, and to be in a place where they don't have to be concerned. They don't have to have fears because you're giving them an education. Mm -hmm. And so. I think it's about changing people's perceptions because yeah. until you actually uh, are exposed to a same-sex family or see how we behave or the, how normal we actually are, I yeah. say that in right. loose terms, but until people physically see that, you don't change perceptions from not educating people unless you educate people and show them that actually we're just like anyone else, yeah. that allows them to change perceptions. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that it really helps to eliminate the fear, which is really at the root of all of that, isn't it? Totally, absolutely. Yeah. So tell us about where you are today. You've just had a baby, another baby, five kids, Katie, Tallulah, and Duke. Yeah. Uh, three kids, five, five, fam five member family. Yeah. What's it like? What's, what, what are you surprised by these days? Well, actually, you ask what it's like, and actually, we're still getting used to <laughs> actually having another little one in the family. Yeah. So it, it's actually, it brought, having Duke has brought back all those emotions and all of that kind of things that you, I think you'd blocked out yeah. uh, when Tallulah was born and yeah. when Tallulah was younger. But it, it hit us like a train last week. It did, and, and I think we, I'd forgotten um, I'd forgotten how 
painful sleep deprivation can be. But then I see Duke and I see Tallulah and I see Katie and I see how we're, our hearts are all stretched by this other human being in our life. And he's touched us all completely differently. Now, at the moment, we're absolutely shattered. But on, you know, when, he, when he catches us in that certain way or we see Tallulah just beaming with love for her brother, it's just incredible. And it makes me proud and it makes me glad that we've done this and we've worked hard to achieve this because it's, it's been a long journey. And this isn't something that happens overnight. You know, when we want children, we have to plan meticulously to make it happen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a never an easy route, is it? And no. It's, you know, it's, and also, there's, there was lots of anticipation around what it would, our family unit would be like with another member in it. And it's kind of a little bit more than we expected, wasn't it, really? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. And, and, you know, Tallulah's out of nappies now, out of diapers now. And she sleeps well. Uh, she's doing really well at, at, at nursery. So things <laughs> were getting our life back to normal. And then, um, yeah, and then this little joy called Duke came along and we're just doing it all again. And you're so going to be what's really, what's really shocked at how easy it is, how much easier it is this time around. What were you going to say? I think it's, you know, for, for us as a couple, you know, we have to really want a family or to extend our family. This is not something that you do lightly because there's so much you have to go through to get to this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not, you know, just, not just emotionally, uh, financially, but also you're also putting another family through this as well. Yeah. So our surrogates family, it's not a case of it just being us. And it's never just a case of just being the surrogate. It's the whole surrogate's family mm -hmm. are going through this process with us for the duration of that pregnancy. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility as a, as a couple. You know, it's not just about us. If it was just our own kind of emotions we were dealing with and our own financials we were dealing with, then we would take less. We, we wouldn't view it as much. But I think when you are, you're working with another family who rely on, all of those things and are going through the same types of emotion. It's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. L let's back up just a little bit and talk about <clears throat> the whole process. And let's start with when you decided to have children, what was that process like for you? And then, you know, let's walk through actually going to figure out surrogacy and all of that. Sure. So uh, when I met Michael, Michael uh, talked to me about children from a very early age. Sorry, not an early age, but from very early in our relationship. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted children and I wanted to make sure that the next person that I met that I really liked, I needed to know if they wanted kids. Um, because I just spent a long time in a relationship with someone that didn't. And I really liked him. And I knew I would be with him forever. Um, so I needed to know if he wanted children. And obviously when I found out he had kids, I was like, brilliant. And then when I found out he wanted children, I was like, this is great. So we researched surrogacy. Um, when, I, when, we, when, when we say we, we mean me. Um, research surrogacy international surrogacy first of all so what we looked at all of the other options and countries available to us and we spent nearly three years looking at all of the various options before we started the journey so we looked at india thailand nepal the us canada mexico the ukraine northern cyprus you know we, we just and we were going to international fertility conferences just to weigh up the options and we, we kept, we, we, we just didn't concentrate enough on the UK because we were unsure what we wanted that journey to look like. And I think also we were, we were unsure of, of how, what the, whether it was viable whether in the UK and whether there was enough surrogates and whether it was something that was going to mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. viable. Because there's one of the things and one of the reasons why we set up two dads is because of the limited 
limited resource that's available online for intended fathers you know there's virtually none so hence why we spent so long doing so much research um so wouldn't we realize that the uk was viable and it wasn't illegal because that's the most preconception is that it's illegal well yes commercial surrogacy is illegal um, but altruistic surrogacy like canada um, is perfectly legal so we started to explore that a little bit more and we eventually decided that that felt right and was the better option for us so we could be involved in all of those scan appointments we could go to the embryo transfer we could see our baby growing in inside the surrogate and we could be there and support her and her family so the uk option um was was the right choice for for us yeah and that kind of takes us up till sort of 2015 i reckon so after we got married uh in august 2014 towards the end of that year was when we were like right okay let's start putting ourselves out there let's seeing where how do we even find a surrogate and that's when the journey started so <laughs> i i mean that is a whole lot of planning. You did a couple of years of planning before you were even married and still had a year to go ish. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly that. And so, that's like, like what Wes said a minute ago, you know, there's so much planning involved in this and there are no accidental children born in gay relationships. <laughs> you know, we have to, if you want them biologically and even to adopt or to foster the preparation and the planning is key. And we want, we didn't want to make a mistake. Um, so we wanted to make sure we, we did what was right for us. I imagine that making a mistake is a multi-year problem. In other words, if I make a mistake or I have a, I, I miscarry something like that, I, I'm not years out. And I imagine that you, you're at least a year or two out from the time that that, mm -hmm. if you make a mistake. Yeah. And, you know, we, we had, we did have an issue with a foul transfer the second time round when we were trying for Duke. And it, that cost us dearly financially because we didn't just have a foul transfer. We ended up losing five embryos all on the same time. So that entire IVF cycle and all of those eggs were just lost in an instant. So it, you know, these are very expensive mistakes and we don't want to make them. So hence why we need to be belts and braces and make sure we do it properly. So talk a little bit about <clears throat> finding a surrogate and what the process was of actually making the decision and the things that went into the decision. I, I just can't even imagine how huge of a decision this is in terms of really finding a comfort level and that this is going to make sense. And, and that, I mean, you're really making a lifetime commitment at some level with a secure, with a surrogate, aren't you? Yeah, you, yeah, you really are. And, that, and that's exactly the way to go into this. Um, this is not here, you know, because of altruistic surrogacy and surrogacy generally, you know, yes, there are, there, there are bad cases and, there, and it can go wrong. But where it goes right, it's down to the relationship being perfect. It's down to investing, the time. investing that time with that surrogate to build a friendship because that woman and her family are going to welcome you and they are going to give you that gift of, of your child. And you, you have to go into this with your eyes wide open. And, and where it often falls down or goes wrong is where people don't behave like that. So our advice to couples is to... to invest in that time in getting to know your surrogate and we um we only ever met one surrogate and that was the surrogate that had both of our children um and we we have a saying in our relationship and from the day we met it just felt right so we're very much into what you know your gut tells you at a certain point and um meeting her and speaking to her, it, there was just a sign. It just felt right that this was the woman that was going to complete our family. It was very young, wasn't it? Yeah. As it? Well, as soon as we met them, I mean, we, we met them by, you know, Michael can talk through how, you know, we got to actually meet them. But when we first physically met them, we went out for dinner. And 
it just was very easy. Mm-hmm. We just got along really well, and it and it and it did just feel right. There was no apprehension or there was no concerns. And you know, since from then to now, she's been our surrogate for our two children, and we'll be eternally grateful for that. Mm-hmm. I, I imagine the other thing is. <laughs> That, that you have to take into consideration is not only in this, in your case, are you dealing with the surrogate and wanting to create that relationship? In, in your case, isn't she married? She yes. is, yeah. And so there's, there's that consideration, not that it's necessarily a bad thing, but it's, you know, all of a sudden two becomes four in this whole yeah. process. Yeah. And she had four children or has four children. So it was important that we introduced Katie to her children because this, whilst, you know, our surrogate was a gestational or she was a host, she was a carrier. So it it wasn't her eggs. So we had an egg donor as well. Um, But regardless, um, we were entering into um, a, a lifelong friendship, I guess. And it was just a case of making sure that everybody was on the same page. Everybody was comfortable because if, if any party in, in that, those two families was uncomfortable, then it, it's not meant to be. Um, and we spent that time going on days out, going for meals, meeting for coffee. And she lived two hours drive away from where we were. So not too far. So we, we made and we invested that time to get to know. And that's mm. exactly what we did for about eight, nine months before we started any fertility treatment. No kidding. Eight or nine months. Yeah. yeah. And, and talk, I want to ask you a couple of questions, but the first one is just talk about the role that that distance away played for you guys in making this decision. Was that, was there advantages to that, that she was a couple hours away or did that make it more stressful for you? No, it kind of did make it more stressful for us, particularly around the time when she was about to give birth. Uh, but generally, you know, to it's not a long way off, but it, you know, with technology nowadays, mm-hmm. you can kind of still keep, in contact on a regular basis and mm-hmm. use technology to aid that yeah. so that's exactly what we did you know we would we would talk most days and it's all about finding the right level what's right for your surrogate in terms of how how often you communicate and what's right for us it's kind of finding that balance and i think we, we found it pretty early on yeah we did and i think that's that's a really important point because what what's right for us we know several people and we've counseled several people that have been through surrogacy and some surrogates don't want to be pestered. They don't want the over contact. They, they might not be a fluffy tactile type of character of which I am and of which Wes is. Um, so finding that level of, um, I guess that personal space understanding. and understanding is really, really important. And Two hours journey for in the US, that's that's nothing. In the UK, two hours is is a is a bit of a journey. Um, and like Wes said, stressful at point of pregnancy, but in terms of the getting to know, I think it worked. I think it, it was it was a nice distance. You know, we it's important to remember that we we all have lives outside of surrogacy, and neither one of us wanted to live in each other's pocket. So we had a very good understanding that. We, are, we have our separate lives, but ultimately there's, there are two people, two humans that have been created that will bring those two lives together at some point. So talk just a little bit about how you came to the decision. I know that it felt right, and I think that's huge. Obviously, you didn't want to make this a purely financial transaction, and I, I imagine you would cancel, counsel anybody away from that. But when you think about the process for finding this person and then saying they're the right one beyond it feeling right, which I think is the most important. What else, what were the other determining factors that you guys had to look at? I think it's about, uh, you know, the surrogates lifestyle, Lifestyle. their, you know, their choices, Mm -hmm. uh, how they live their life, you know, their diet. It's, you know, all of those things are really important because they're going to carry your, potentially carry your child for mm-hmm. nine months. So you want to make sure and have the reassurance and mm-hmm. comfort that mm-hmm. they're going to do everything that's in the best interest of the child. And I think that they, they were some of the conversations we had pretty early on, even yeah. before we met up with yeah. our surrogate. You know, some of those questions, you know, going back and forth uh, via messages around trying to understand 
about values, trying to understand about health and trying to understand about all of those elements, lifestyle is really important. Yeah. And, and one of the things which really warmed us to her from the get go really was she was adamant she wanted to do this for a gay couple. Um, and, you know, and her reasons for that were around, you know, family creation and how difficult it is for 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 men particularly that want a family so that was that was that really resonated with us um, because not all surrogates want to no. uh, you know have children for same sex couples it's you know that, that's a and, choice people make and there are you know there are surrogates that will, will f- refuse to to do a journey for for a gay couple and that's and that's their choice you know so that's right. it is what it is um but yeah a lifestyle was really important and you know, you, you know when someone's a kind soul, you know, you know when someone has a good heart. You just, as you know, we can all see that. And you see that in her, you know, her soul is just adorable. And I couldn't think of anyone better to carry our children. Actually, we're very lucky to have found her. We're so lucky to have found her. And, and how did you find her? So there are a number of ways that you can network with surrogates in the UK. You have, there are three main not-for-profits that operate. Um, one of them, which I do a fair bit of work for, is Surrogacy UK. And there are two others. There's COTS and Brilliant Beginnings. Because you can openly and actively advertise for a surrogate in the UK. Yeah, it's illegal in the UK to advertise for a surrogate um, under the Surrogacy Arrangements Act of 85, um, which is currently up for reform. But what we what you what you can do is that you can approach one of the not-for-profits and they can um have getting to know you sessions or or networking events um or they can have a matching service now back in 2015 all of their books were closed for new registrations because there were not enough surrogates and far too many intended parents so that meant we had to do what's known as the independent route and that's find our own surrogate um find our own clinic and do everything ourselves which we were fine with because we just spent a number of years doing a ton of research so we were quite clued up with what to do so what first was surprising is the number of closed safe facebook groups that exist for surrogacy in the us and in europe um, so i became a member uh, in the majority of those groups and I began talking to and building relationships with a number of surrogates just chatting online um, and as well as that as well there's also um, a couple of online um, networking profiles outside of Facebook um, almost like a, uh, an intended parent or a sperm donation or an egg donation um, matching service online and we registered with one of those services and that's how we found our surrogate she approached us after reading our profile and we'd had our profile for about a month and she uh, contacted us and I really liked what she had to say and I loved that she had a family and she homeschooled her kids and she had a successful equestrian business. She was really into the outdoor life and horses. And I was just, we just got a feeling like, yeah, we need to meet, we need to meet her. And we did uh, about a month or two later. And then the process began of getting to know her. And it was probably about uh, six to eight weeks after that, we kind of then started saying to her, yeah, I think, I think, we want to continue to invest in this because this feels right. And she felt the same. Because mm. some couples, they invest a lot of time and energy into surrogates and then they get so far down the line and then the relationship fails and then they have to start again. So it is quite challenging. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it is, you know, by just uh, continuing to talk exclusively to one surrogate, you are kind of then putting all your eggs in one basket, shall we say. But for us, there was no question. It just did feel right. And we just continued with comfort uh, having the conversations with our surrogate. Yeah. Very cool. It's, it, I mean, obviously you must feel very lucky when you see what other uh, couples have gone through in terms of finding a surrogate. And that, I can't even imagine how difficult that must be to lose one in the mm-hmm. process. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. 
let's talk a little bit about an egg donor. You know, all of these things that we just kind of, in the straight community, we don't think about any of this, do we? Uh, no, you've got it so easy at so times. So easy. <laughs> Until you have the kids and then it's all the same, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that is the but, same. <laughs> talk a little bit about the process of uh, an egg donor, uh, which is, I hadn't even considered. Well, first of all, we were shocked at how expensive eggs were. Yeah. <laughs> because we obviously need to buy eggs and yeah. you know they were very expensive. Yeah. And you know, that was one of the things that we hadn't really, you know, didn't even understand. And when really. when we were looking into the into the um the international market, that's when it really shocked us that, you know, eggs can go for twenty, twenty five thousand dollars. Um Wow. And I we were like, Oh wow. So when we found a clinic that we really liked, um, that particular clinic luckily had a really good egg bank. Um, because sometimes you can work for quite a long period of time. If you're quite specific about mm -hmm. the donor's characteristics or the characteristics that you want, and the, the clinics don't have those characteristics, you can sometimes work for quite a while. Because in the UK, um, egg donation or donation generally sperm or egg is non anonymous. So what that means is that you'll never see, uh, you'll never know the uh, donation. You'll never know the donor's name or their photograph or where they live. And when the donor donates, it becomes non anonymous in the fact that when that child becomes 18 years old, they get full disclosure should the child want it. Now, unlike in the States or in parts of other places in Europe where you can see a photograph of your donor, we can't do that in the UK. That's where egg donation is anonymous. So you give your clinic criteria, uh, of which we were quite particular on eye color and hair color and height and skin tone. Because, um, because what we decided to do was that uh, to, Michael's the biological father of Tallulah. So we decided that what we wanted to do is if we could have children of our own, biologically, we chose characteristic, my characteristics, so that we had uh, as close to what we could have if naturally we if we were have. to have children. So Tallulah's, was, Tallulah's donor was blonde, blue, fair. Um, same as him, same as Katie. Because we wanted, we wanted that similarity within our family unit. And uh, we, we got that. We couldn't have got that even any more so than than what we have you know so many people think Tallulah is biologically where it is which is exactly what we wanted to achieve um so the clinic found our egg donor and it took them about four months to find a donor that was known to the clinic so that meant that they'd already had fertility treatment with them and their eggs were viable so we got matched to a donor um and we fertilized i fertilized those eggs we got four blastocysts out of five eggs so we did really well in terms of the conversion and we transferred um one obviously and we got a positive pregnancy after 14 days so it we were one of the lucky ones it worked first time yeah um and we it, we hear stories of you know of other gay couples who've had four or five uh, attempt spent you know a crazy amount of money and still not have uh, a positive pregnancy at the end of it so you know we, we do realize how lucky we were with Tallulah you know that first time but I think that look also comes down to how much we planned you know we we didn't just choose the first clinic that we saw we did our research into the best fertility clinics in the area you know we looked at the HFEA um, live birth rates to see which clinics not only were experiencing surrogacy, not only were respectful of the LGBT community, but also had a really good above average live birth rate. And we picked a clinic that ticked all of those boxes and we, we, got, we got what the desired outcome was. And, we, and, and you know, like most uh, organizations, there are the cheaper ends and there are the higher ends. You know, the, the, the clinic that we chose wasn't the cheapest, but we wanted we're investing a lot of emotion and money uh -huh. into this. So we want to give it the best chance, which is why we chose the clinic we did. I am um, so amazed at the number of decisions that have to go into this and then that it can all fall apart. I just, yeah. oh, I, I, it's, it's, 
it's huge. I mean, it mm-hmm. really is, an, is about as intentional a thing as you can do, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It is. And it's, and you know, fertility treatment is so stressful and not enough people talk about it because mm-hmm. it's a taboo subject. People fear that it makes them inferior or, or, or less of a man or less of a woman if you are struggling to conceive. And one of the things that we do with two dads is we, we take away that fear of talking about infertility and we've done work with some amazing organizations, Fertility Fest being one of them, mm-hmm. where we talk about um, you know, male factor infertility or female factor infertility. And we, we bring the topics together with humor where you can. And we, we shed some light on, on what can be a really stressful point in, in, in a marriage or relationship. And, and yeah. And not actually, you know, taking into account uh, the grueling time and that a surrogate has to go through with fertility you know it's she's doing this voluntarily mm-hmm. without any gain you know it's not her child so you know the, the selfless act of actually going through fertility treatment is you know it's it's very grueling it's hard yeah now just to be clear one of the things you talked about is commercial surrogacy versus altruistic surrogacy what's the difference between the two so here in the UK, we don't have commercial surrogacy. Um, so the difference between the two is that organizations can't profit or surrogates can't profit from surrogacy. So we don't have commercial agreements between a surrogate and an intended parent or a clinic and an intended parent or surrogate. Now, altruistic means um, it's purely through um, donation. So the surrogate can be compensated, reasonable expenses only, and not um, profit through surrogacy. So reasonable expenses in the UK for surrogacy is around between 12 and 16,000 pounds per pregnancy. That's what's that's what's seen as reasonable expenses. And, that, uh, go ahead. and that's massively different to what it is in, 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 in the US. And I imagine that the, the benefit of that is that what you end up with is somebody as a surrogate who has their heart in the game in a much bigger way. Is that true? Uh, absolutely that and it's and, and there's a saying and it's a, it's a phrase that's coined by surrogacy uk and it's um and it's and it's to do with love you know surrogacy is all built on on love and friendship and and it's exactly that because it it it, it really is and it surrogates are not motivated by money in the uk um and and it's fine if there are surrogates that, that do this as a career and do it because, because they're compensated well. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but I'm more comfortable um, that our family was created through altruistic surrogacy um, and that our surrogate wasn't motivated by, by the money. Let's talk a little bit about... <clears throat> the process from the time that your surrogate has uh, a a baby growing inside of her until delivery, there must be some real milestones. And I imagine at some point you you have to say, oh my gosh, this is really happening or or some kind of a milestone where you really get a sense of how important this is. Talk a little bit about that, would you? Mm -hmm. I think for me, that milestone moment is when, because when you're going through fertility treatment and once you've had an embryo implanted, very early on you do a lot of scans to just like multiple days to see whether it's taken on all of those things. For me, it was once we'd got a positive mm-hmm. uh, test. Result, test and seeing the heartbeat in very early on when it was four weeks after four transfer, weeks, seeing that heartbeat and hearing the heartbeat at such an at four early. weeks a four weeks transfer you you see and hear that that you know 
I can remember hearing it now. Yeah. Because we wasn't expecting to hear it. No, it stunned it just us both. Really, the room, and we were like, it, wow. it filled the room. This booming sound filled the room. And it was our baby's heartbeat yeah, four weeks, at four weeks. And it was like, oh my god, this is real. Yeah, look what we've created. Yeah, and 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 the, as, as Wes says, the great thing is you're scanned then at six weeks, you're scanned at eight weeks, you're scanned at ten weeks, and then you're scanned at twelve weeks when you're released into the what 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 is our, our system. NHS system, national health system. Um, and then you're in the NHS, you're scanned at 12 weeks, and you're scanned at 20 weeks. And that's usually it, um, depending on the age of the, of the woman. Um, and we were scanned a few more times this time around. Um, but as those scans then start to get more advanced, so you start to see, you know, hands and feet. And then there's 4D scans now. So you get to see your little human whilst they're still in the womb. Um, that's then you know weird slash incredible because it's just like oh my god this is just incredible and i think every time because we it was really important to us that we were there for all those key miles at the moment which is one of the reasons we preferred the uk journey because we wanted to go to the midwife appointments and we wanted to see you know be part of that yeah. whole process because with our surrogate living two hours away from us it would be very easy not to be in touch and feeling all these things happening. So mm -hmm. it was really important to us that we went to every midwife appointment and we went to every scan and we yep. were there supporting our surrogate, which also helped continue to build and grow our relationship. And I think we'd have a different relationship now if we didn't follow that path. Yeah, agreed. And then I guess when it starts to get real at home, so the nursery gets done, the pram gets delivered, the car seat finally goes in the car, the bag's packed, the, the, then, then the bag's packed, you know, and, and we have to pack two. We have to pack one for our surrogate that we send to her in case we don't get there in time. Right. And then we buy another one for here. So we have two bags that we have to buy. It's very expensive for us guys. And then we have to be doubly prepared um, because we've got friends that have missed the birth of their child. Um, which must be devastating when you've gone through all of this planning. Um, but fortunately, that didn't happen to us. Um, but yeah, can I, we've... Can I just interrupt for just a second? Because I recall seeing a video on your website where you didn't know with Tallulah that you were going to be able to see her being born. Isn't that correct? That's correct, yeah. Oh my God, you must have been so thrilled. Ah, oh, thrilled doesn't even come into it. It's It, it was probably... I would say th it's difficult now because the, we have more than one child together, mm -hmm. but it's probably one of the moments that I know I will remember until the day I die. It, 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 it was such a, an experience and a pleasure and something that we, we didn't even think was going to happen because here in the UK, it's policy that um, when your sur when when a woman has a cesarean section only one person is allowed into theater and that's usually their partner um but within a surrogacy arrangement you have their partner if they have one and then you have one or two intended parents and if there are two then one of you isn't going to see your child being born and we never wanted to be the one that did or the one that didn't so we said you know what we'll it's more important that she has her husband with her and she feels safe and secure. So that's what we agreed. But it was actually, and we only found out this uh, when Duke was born, but it, cause we had the same anesthetist uh, has, as when Tallulah was born. And it, apparently it was Caroline, our surrogate, who actually asked the doctor in theater staff if we could be present. And we'd actually accepted that we wasn't going to be there. And we were waiting in a side room for uh, our surrogate's husband to bring the baby through. And, you know, it was... It was just like... It, it's, 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 it's so emotional for us to talk about because it was, it was a moment that we thought we would miss. And, and we'd accepted. And we'd accept... And, and how bad is that? That we accepted that we would miss the birth of our own child. We accepted it. We, we bowed down to process and protocol and was like, do you know what? We'll miss the birth of our child. 
but we didn't and we got to see it and as a result of that we're doing a greater piece of work now with every NHS hospital in the UK 134 hospitals to work with them to change their policy to allow intended parents to see the birth of their child with their surrogate and if their surrogate wants to bring another person into theatre as well because it's discriminatory against surrogates and intended parents so we're, we're working hard to change national policy to make it possible that every couple gets to see the child of their baby being born and it just goes to show that they it can be done oh sorry hold on just a minute i'm hitting the wrong there i am i'm sorry there you go yeah, I mean, it just goes to show that it wasn't that hard to actually do it because we were allowed in. And then on our second with Duke, we were allowed in. Yeah. So it can be done. And there's no logical reason why we can't be there. So if we can do it twice, why can't it be done as, as common practice, you know, yeah. for all same-sex couples? Uh, my, ne my next question is, uh, what was the most expected or, or, or the, the really good parts about surrogacy and, and the bad parts? And I imagine one of the best parts was getting lucky. I just can't imagine how lucky you guys were to have this surrogate who she really went uh, above and beyond, didn't she? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we've, we've had an amazing two journeys with her. Um, it's been a real experience in getting to know her and her family so we know we've been lucky and there's been highs and lows hasn't mm -hmm. there? All it's the challenging through, no, you know, it's, it's, ne it's never straightforward you know no. we're, we're dealing with lots of different people with different you know needs and wants and it's how you know how you navigate through that and still come out at the end with the same goals mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what it was like some of the the difficulties with the surrogacy uh, process um, so the law in the UK is the biggest frustration. Um, so for those that aren't aware, um, when a child in the UK is I'm just going to quickly check you. Okay, when a child is born in the UK, um, and particularly if your surrogate's married, the surrogate and her husband are the legal parents of your child when that child is born. So that's that's the biggest low at present. Um, because it's 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 frustrating now if you've got a great relationship with your surrogate from the start then that shouldn't be an issue that shouldn't be a concern because genuine surrogates don't want to keep babies you know genuine surrogates want to hand back what's rightfully yours so yes the law is is a real frustrating time and the fact that we have to go through the parental order process which means we submit our application to the court at six weeks and one day old so once the baby is six weeks and one day we submit our application to the court to start the po process the parental order process and that process is where our surrogate and her husband are removed from the birth certificate and we are added to it. And we then in the eyes of the law are the legal parents. And that process from the application being submitted takes about a further 10 weeks. So your child generally is about four or five months old before this comes to a close, which can be a really stressful time because in the eyes of the law, that surrogate has that time period to change their mind if that's what they wanted to do. But this is the whole point of getting to know a surrogate well and to set up reasonable intent and to show intention. So to make sure that you have uh, a document between all parties which sets out the intention of the journey. Um, should it go pear-shaped, um, courts can see that there was always an intention um, to enter into uh, an arrangement of surrogacy. I, I'm shocked at uh, <clears throat> the fact that you are not the legal guardians of your children for up to four or five months. I mean, not only do you have the beginning of the process, which can take years, the actual process of, of the surrogate being pregnant, but then another four or five months before you're legally uh, the parents of your children. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, just just think of a scenario where you have children that are born and uh, they need and need some kind of medical intervention. The hospital would get consent from the surrogate and her husband, and not rather, from and not from uh, the you know the intended yeah, parents, parents because legally they aren't there now. Obviously, you know we made provision for that within our intention document, and we had those you know quite difficult conversations with our surrogate and her husband about you know, all of these worst case scenarios and what would happen. And unfortunately, those conversations needed to be had. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was prudent for us to do it. And if we didn't do it, we'd be irresponsible. So it was important that we were all on the same page. And we did, you know, look for every eventuality and what the, you know, what the plan B would be. Mm-hmm. Now, we even had conversations around, you know, if our surrogate was pregnant and we were both killed what would be the plan then and you know unfortunately with surrogacy and the way that we chose to create our families we we're always having to be one step ahead mm-hmm. and always having to think about things that most people just don't ever have to con- contemplate yeah we you know we had to change our wills um that should wes or i be both killed before our child was born that we had to make provisions for where that child would live and, you know, you, you have to think like that because our surrogate doesn't want this child. It's not biologically hers. She, she's doing this out of the goodness of her heart. She doesn't want to be left with the child at the end of a journey. So, again, it's, it's down to ensuring that relationship is, is as watertight as it can be. And if it is, then the frustrations with the law shouldn't be a concern. Um, but it is what it is it's currently the, the the great news is that the new proposal from the law commissioners of england and wales and scotland is really positive and this new proposed law change is f- incredible it's still probably three to four years have been implemented but it's definitely um a, a more inclusive sensible law talk a little bit about the differences I, a lot of what you've talked about in terms of, uh, or some of what you've talked about in terms of you know, the, the considerations a sur- surrogate parents have to think about, th- what are the difference between a straight couple doing this in the UK and a gay couple doing that? Uh, and, and how does that kind of play out? Um, in terms of the process, um, it's very, very similar. Um, certainly from a, from a surrogacy, if you look at the, 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 the surrogacy arrangements act of 1985, um, it was later amended to allow same sex, um, couples to, to be involved. So there, there are still safeguarding checks, regardless of whether you're gay or straight, there are still, there's still intervention from an organization, a government organization called CAFCAS, which, um, they, will do home checks uh, and safe, further safeguarding checks on the commissioning couple. Um, so the journeys are very, very similar. Where it gets, not complicated, but where it differs is once, the, once you're pregnant and you're in the system, because it's the, it's the hospitals and our NHS system, which isn't quite adapted for two men having babies that's where there's the challenge and that's where some hospitals will going back to our first point will go well that's our policy no that's not how we do things here it's this or lump it and we're about actually being a bit more well no let's talk about that because everything anything's possible let's have a rational conversation is it because you've never managed a surrogacy arrangement for two men before and you're just being a bit um cautious with it or is that the actual policy so um that's the main difference because uh, there's lots of protocols around um having two men on a maternity ward for example um so you have to navigate your way through that which is a little bit different so generally that's probably the main difference would you agree i would yeah i think it's about you know the, the mechanics of conception are a little bit different depending on whether they're eggs, it's male factor or female factor, but also then once once you've you've you know you are pregnant, it then is quite similar up until the point where you need to uh, manage the birthing plan. Yeah, 
it's the birthing plan that needs a little bit more work. And would you say that uh, most of the differences that you face as a gay couple are more perceptions of, of what you guys are doing or not having experience working with a gay couple in surrogacy, or is it more uh, legal in the law? I think it's probably a bit of both. Mm -hmm. It's a bit a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, and I think it's also about how people people's perception of the law, because yeah. you know our NHS trust works are the same law as a lot of other trusts, but they were still able to give us a very positive experience. So that was within the law. But I think it's about the trust and the people working with you being open to having conversations about. You know, we I remember being. Uh, in the early stages of, of us meeting our consultant, coming away from the meeting and saying to Michael, this doesn't feel right. It's really, it just doesn't feel right. It's not fair and it doesn't feel right. And it kind of just stuck in my throat that we're not going to accept this. And we didn't. And they did change because it's, but it's being, I think it's having the confidence and the ability to be able to challenge and say, no, I'm not going to accept this. This is not right. Because I think a lot of uh, same-sex couples, particularly male, are so so grateful for grateful where they to are be at. in that position that they just accept anything. And that's not us, you know. That's why that's why we're quite outspoken. And you could probably push us more on the activist side because I I'm fine with being called an activist. Um, well, we just won't put up with it. No, and I want to I I want to leave. I want to leave a legacy for other intended fathers that the work and the path that we pay, and this isn't to be some hero, but this is to ensure that other couples don't have to go through some of the legal expenses that we went through. Because we did, we had to send an intention to sue this particular hospital, which cost us thousands of pounds. Because it didn't feel right. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately, when we did that our initial, you know, intention to sue, we, it was very early on in our relationship with the trust, mm -hmm. but, you know, they quickly, we started open dialogue with them about the things that we really needed uh, to make our pregnancy. And we didn't want anything out of the ordinary. Yeah, we weren't asking for this child to be delivered by a swarm of white doves. This was a regular, we just wanted a regular pregnancy. We just wanted the same as everyone else. Yeah, and we weren't being given the same as everybody else. You know, when you're told you will have your baby given to you in the car park, because that's what you would have to do, because that's what the law states. No, the law, it was more about them trying to do everything off the, the off the trust's facilities. So they didn't want it to happen on handover. Handover in the hospital. It had to be outside of the hospital. And I mean, we were just like, we were like, no, we're not gonna stand for that. But but by not but by standing up for that, um, the Department of Health, which is obviously who acts on behalf of the government, they then re-released updated guidance for surrogates and intended parents and for healthcare professionals which is what we were involved in in February of 2018. And that got re-released two years after our child was born for hospitals to go, do you know what? That was unacceptable before. You guys now need to adopt these new sets of rules. But that's just the first stage. And although it's guidance, trusts don't have to accept it. So what we're doing, doing now, now is trying to uh, understand what trusts have adopted the revision in guidance on which trusts have just kept it the same because we're, we're not this is something now that we're really passionate about and I don't think people realize the impact it has on them mm -hmm. when they're starting their journey and you know going through two successful journeys within an HS trust hospital it can be done so you know we aren't going to accept a trust telling us that it has to be this and it has to be that we're going to work tirelessly to make sure that trusts adopt a, a friendly uh, policy that works for all. Mm -hmm. When when you talk about trusts, I, I don't think it's a, a term that's common in, in, in regards to hospitals in the United States. Tell us just a little bit about what that is. So the word trust essentially, it, it means it's, it's a group of hospitals. So a trust might be um, it's generally geographically based, isn't it? Yeah. So a tr every every major city has its own trust, and replace the word trust with hospital. It, it, it that's the the most basic thing to understand. Got it. 
So the question that I have at this point is, what is it that you would, you know, now being through this twice and understanding a lot of the in and outs, what are some of the most important things that you think a gay couple should be thinking about as they approach this, this multi-year decision? Mm -hmm. I think the first thing, and we underestimated it massively, and you kind of just mentioned it, and it's like how long this whole process yeah. takes and about having a real clear understanding of the timelines. And this is something that we recommend from a very early stage, because I think often people's perceptions about how long this process is going to take uh, is often very, very much misjudged, mm -hmm. uh, primarily because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Uh, but it, for me, the biggest, one of the big things early on is understanding what this time frame looks yeah. like. And I would say to couples, in fact, someone asked, we did a, a Q and A session yesterday on, on our Instagram and Facebook story. And someone asked, what's that timeline? And, um, it's about from start to finish, I would probably say from deciding you want to do surrogacy to having your child, I'd probably say it's two years on average, some longer, sometimes it's longer. Um, but that's what I would, would say. So I think the time factor is really important. Um, don't ever underestimate the power of a relationship. Yeah. It has to be next because that, that is where, the horror stories occur that is where um you know you may meet people that might take advantage of you you know you're vulnerable you're childless you're yearning for this family to be completed and you don't want to be taken for advantage and and so so invest in that relationship um surrogates are amazing you know these women um are just incredible human beings and take the time to get to know them um, so that's uh, something I would say would be really, really important. And, and obviously cost, you, and, and the, the, the third would be the bu budget for what you're getting yourself in for. Um, there are a number of ways that surrogacy can be, um, costed and, you know, some people op opt for what's known as traditional surrogacy, which is home insemination. So there's no IVF involved. So you instantly don't have that cost and the cost of eggs, um, so your your cost can be halved essentially. Um, so depending on what the, your budget is or what you have to spend, then that needs to be a factor. There, just so much, so much to consider, isn't there? Now there is, there is, but I don't want that to you know kind of put people off because there is lots to consider. And but also equally you wouldn't go into this kind of arrangement where it involves your future children without doing all of the consideration needed. Yeah. So there should be lots to consider because this isn't something that you should do lightly. But equally, once you have considered it, it's relatively straightforward. It is. It is. I, uh, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. It's once, once you, first of all, even know where to get the information or know what, what experts to speak to or, or to lean on, the rest... Because the clinics in the UK, for example, are more and more clued up with surrogacy than they ever have, to, have done. You know, it's it's the biggest increase in the national statistics from the HFEA of this of 2017 versus 2016. And it's only going to go one way. And it's only increasing. So clinics are more and more aware, and more clinics are having more surrogacy programs now. So once you know what it is you want to do, and you've spoken to either a not for profit or someone like us then that can help navigate the, the rest of the journey, which then is quite straightforward. Uh, I, the other question that I have is, what do you want to say to um, straight people about this process? What do you think it is that they don't understand or that you'd like them to understand more clearly? That's a good question. Mm. Um, I I just want people to be a little bit more respectful and non-judgmental about our right to want to be parents. Now, regardless of who I lie next to and regardless of my sexual preference, I'm a man that has a need to be a dad. 
and that's all of our right if we choose to parent so regardless of your prejudices i think you need to just be a kind and a decent human being and just see the fact that we all have, have that yearning in us and just be respectful of the fact that someone wants children because we're really good at it you know we provide a safe living home for our kids and um we're good dads we're you know we we parent just like you guys do just be a bit more open-minded to um this community which are great at being role models and parents just like heterosexuals are and my view is and, um, and what i would say to a heterosexual couple or someone with prejudice would be why not why not you know yeah. And, and bringing that discussion out is is the way that you start to break down some of those barriers. Because as we've talked about already, so much of the issue that uh, people that don't understand this is is rooted in fear, right? It's fear. Of course it is. Of course it is. Now, whether, whether you know, that's other type of prejudice, and, you know, you're seeing it in the U.S. at the minute. You know, we've seen it here. Um, it tends to be fear and ignorance. And, and often, often actually, it's, it's on people not being given the full stories, but they're making lots of assumptions. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if they stopped for a second and actually realised and took the time to understand exactly what was going on versus their assumptions, then... I'd like to think that their rational mind would see a different picture to the one they saw previously. And we've, um, this is on the same topic, but it's, it, it's important to probably say, we had an issue a month ago where we had one of our followers on Instagram that made the effort to contact me. And she quite honestly said that she comes from a homophobic family. She was brought up and taught that homophobia or homo uh, that, that gays and lesbians were not a particular great community. So that was taught, that behavior was taught. She thought that gay people having children was wrong. And then she followed our account and she followed us on Instagram and she followed us on Facebook and she saw the journey that we'd been on and she saw how we'd parent Tallulah and she sees what a character Tallulah is. And she says it's completely changed her mind on gays parenting and how it's completely the same and how she's thoroughly ashamed of what she was taught, but how now she's educating others about what it's like to be gay and to have children. And it just goes to show you can, it, you know, inclusion starts with education. And this is exactly what we're trying to do very subtly. You know, we don't, we understand that our, our, our life and what we do isn't everybody's preference and ideal. We understand and we respect that. But if people want to look in and, and follow us, then they'll see and they can come along for that journey. And often than not, the, the feedback's been really positive. Uh, I, I, one place that I want to go back to that I think is, is worth talking a little bit about is you talked about some of the things that you had to do, like the threat of, a, of suing a trust, a hospital trust. Talk about navigating like how you have conversation versus becoming somebody who's like, no, this is not okay. And how you, you walk that line, because I imagine a big piece of what makes you guys so good at what you're doing in terms of advocacy for, for gay surrogacy is about how to have conversations that people can hear when it's appropriate. And when I have to really say, now, wait a minute, this is just not okay. Talk a little bit about walking that line, would you? Hmm. Yeah, I think for, for us, I, I recall some of the conversations when we first met with our consultant and, you know, and, I, and I'll say it to start with, we didn't have the courage to start with uh, to actually be saying no. Uh, and it was all about the feelings. And, and also we wanted to, we came out thinking this isn't right. We didn't know what to do. 
we spoke to our lawyer and said, you know, this is how we feel. This is what they're saying. Can you check whether we're being discriminated against? And that's, that's kind of how it started. And then once we had the confidence, the confidence yes, and knew saying. that we had the law, kind of law behind us, that we were, that our lawyer was pretty confident that we were being discriminated against. By the way, we knew we were. <laughs> But it's about, you know, sense checking and making sure that we're doing the right thing. And then once you have the confidence, I think it's pretty easy to be saying to the, the hospital, saying, this is not, com we're not comfortable with this and we would like you to review it and look at a, a different way. Now, following on from that, they changed our consultant, we got a new midwife and the, the relationship turned on its head. Yeah, and we were, we were being listened to, mm -hmm. whereas previously we were... This is the process you have to fit into it. Well, yeah. we're never going to fit into that process. So you need to make a new process for us. Mm -hmm. And this isn't as being Mariah asking for white lilies and unicorns in, in, in the room where our child was born. This is about us saying, we just want a, we just want a regular experience. We yeah. want to experience our child being born. We want to walk out like everyone else does. And we want to just have that same experience. Mm -hmm. But I think it does come down to having the confidence to be able to do it. But again, I think it's about building that relationship. I mean, we could have easily, you know, started being at loggerheads and, you know, we're running out of time. Uh, so it wouldn't have got us anywhere. So I think you do have to take a rational approach to it and to some extent try and take the emotion out of it mm -hmm. and think about logically how are we going to achieve, you know, we haven't got years to do litigation. You know, it's about... And ultimately, this wasn't about us trying to gain anything. It was about just trying to get what we thought we should be getting. I, I think about uh, the, the other piece of advice that I would suggest for people that don't understand two gay dads wanting to have uh, uh, children and a family is that it's no different than what it would be for you if you were a straight person. There's no difference, is there? No difference. No, no difference. No, no difference. Joe, we, we follow uh, lots of you know, same-sex related uh, Instagram accounts, particularly from the US, and they, we aren't the only ones. No. There are thousands, if not millions of people around the world, same-sex couples who have children. Mm -hmm. And this is, we're not, we're not, you know. This we're is, not unique here. We're not unique in any way, shape or form. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we should wrap this uh, super educational and really authentic and genuine uh, piece up about you being two gay dads with three fabulous children and one big happy family. Thank uh, you. I, I'm so impressed. I just can't even begin to tell you. Uh, the last thing that I just want you to talk about is where people can find out more information about being and managing and getting through uh, the surrogacy process. No worries. Okay, so we have a website which is www.2daddies, that's T W O daddies, D A D D I E S, dot co dot UK. And there you'll find uh, our main website with a, a contact us page as well, uh, and there'll be some helpful um, videos and then from there you'll be able to link into our Facebook, our Twitter and our Instagram feed. Um, both Facebook and Instagram is uh, at twodads.u.k. Um, and yeah. you'll see something on there every single day yes. because my husband, Michael, <laughs> bless him, it's not my strength, it's his, is a very uh, I document capable everything. social media <laughs> expert. Perfect. And then didn't you say you had an Instagram post or did I miss you telling yeah, me? Yeah, inst Instagram is the same as Facebook. So two dads, T-W-O-D-A-D-S dot U dot K. Michael and Wes, Katie, Tallulah and Duke, thank you all for what you're doing. I have just tremendous respect for all of what you're doing and the way that you're doing it obviously is not from any place but love, authenticity, and really just wanting to be no different than anybody else. Is that right? Perfect. perfect. That. Exactly that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, we at Conceptual Options, we at Conceptual Options want to thank you so much for your time today and uh, hope we can do something similar in the not too distant future. Best of luck to you.
Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.